Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, allow me to join other colleagues in this honorable house to welcome back the member for Castries Southeast. Um, following um, the major scare he's had in his life, and of course, hospitalization both here in St. Lucia <coughs> and in Martinique. I think when these things happen, we all do have to take a step back and ponder um, for the simple reason that I suspect every parliamentarian in this honorable house probably postponed health issues because of the demands of their responsibilities as representatives of people. And we keep on seeing this time and time and, and time again. And contrary to what people really think, most of us do not even make simple preparations by way of insurance protection for when the moment comes and the hour comes. These are matters that I think we certainly need to, to reflect on and to, to think about um, as we do the business of the, of the people. And if I can offer any advice to him, it is to say that he needs to make sure that he accepts the healing that is so very vital for his own future and for his own survival in the weeks and months ahead and allow his family to take care of him as he goes through this very delicate period. But it is commendable that he was able to join us in Parliament. Mr. Speaker, I want to start this debate this afternoon on my contribution on an unusual note. And I know that um, you have been very kind and generous in these debates, so that you'll allow me moments when I will go on a frolic of my own, um, but always returning to the central business of the, of the day, which is, of course, the estimates of revenue and um, of expenditure. And I want to start, Mr. Speaker, by reflecting a little bit on the process of, of these debates and not to enter necessarily in the issue raised by the leader of the opposition, which I coax the member for Suzelle Solivus not to pursue. Um, because in all my years, when I served as Minister of Finance, and I introduced the estimates of revenue and expenditure, it was never from a prepared text that was circulated to members. In fact, I did so and spoke, as I always do, from notes and I don't know when I go back and look at Hansard what the notes look like, but one is, is I must find out, look to look at the notes to see whether the notes were very coherent. What I said then was um, acceptable. So that has been the pattern, and I don't want to deal with that, but I want to deal with the, the rhythm, the, the process. Mr. Speaker, I have reflected a lot on the approach of parliamentary representatives to the debate on the estimates of revenue and expenditure. And uh, I would say at the very outset that by and large that these debates are very predictable. Although variations do exist as we have seen during this debate, parliamentarians usually start, Mr. Speaker, by commenting on the online philosophy of the estimates. So they speak about the vision contained in the estimates, what's the plan for the ensuing year, particularly as dictated by the expenditure that the government is proposing to, to undertake. Then inevitably after they have commenced on that basis, they then proceed to assess the economic prospects offered by the estimates, so they may choose to focus on a number of indices. They may, of course, want to talk about the growth rates that they see, either the previous year or the forecasts for the ensuing year. They, want to look at, they may look at GDP prospects, then inevitably look at the revenue projections, 
the expenditure details which occupies most of our time. Obviously, they'll pay attention to, to the deficits, which is, of course, becoming increasingly important. And uh, a whole range of things, including event, um, individual allocations to ministries. The third element of the debate comes when individual power ministers explain the allocations to their ministries. And of course, we heard the Minister of Finance explicitly leaving that responsibility to the individual ministers. And this again is time worn because frankly in my tenure, the very same, happened, the same thing happened. We asked the ministers to fill in the gaps by providing details of how they're going to be managing their allocations. Once this is done, Mr. Speaker, then the focus shifts to constituencies to assess what's in the budget for individual constituencies. In that regard, all parliamentarians are of one mind. We become one. All of a sudden, we occupy the same positions. Because all of us become parliamentarians, and those who wear the cloak or the ministerial clothing take those off, and you now become an ordinary parliamentarian to look at what is happening in your individual constituency. Of course, those senators who are ministers don't have that responsibility. They can roam far and wide, Mr. Speaker. But as we saw today and in previous debates, it is not unusual for parliamentary representatives to identify initiatives which are funded, explain to their constituents, well, you know, this particular initiative is, is funded, and this would be the result for the particular constituency. And then, inevitably, they turn to say what's not funded, and to begin to itemize um, the various issues in their constituencies that require a second look or attention at some point in time. And the good thing about this parliament is that, and previous parliaments, I might add, Mr. Speaker, we have always understood this phenomenon that um, parliamentary representatives are given some latitude, as it were, to raise issues pertaining to commitments in their constituencies that have not been met. And we heard eloquent statements this morning, Mr. Speaker, about um, matters that could be funded and matters that could not be funded, for one reason or another, including, of course, unavailability of funds and the very difficult challenges that the government faces in um, um, generating revenue for the kinds of expenditure that are required. So we are, we are accustomed to this. As, a, as hinted earlier, and I know you're wondering where I'm going with this, uh, Ms. Mr. Speaker, as hinted earlier, the order of presentation may in fact change. A parliamentary representative may well decide to give priority to the treatment of his constituency in his opening remarks. And this happened, as we saw earlier on, um, with the presentation by the member for Beaufort North. He decided that he wanted to pay attention to his constituency, so he started off his presentation by focusing on his constituency, giving it priority of treatment, and then coming back to his ministry, and of course, um, to the government and, and the estimates. Now, I, I thought he did a rather clever job when I listened to him because he used the concept of deficits. He says um, he enjoys and he looks forward to the reduction of deficits because he is engaged in a similar endeavor in his constituency to reduce the de deficit of development in his constituency. And of course, it was his rationale for justifying the attention paid to his constituency in the past year, and of course to identify to future challenges in his constituency. I think this is all very healthy for our democracy that we do these things. And there should be no, I would say, particularly angst, or I would say discomfort, when therefore parliamentarians speak eloquently about their needs for their constituencies, and, of course, um, the requirements of their constituents and their concerns of their cons con constituents. I have learned over time that a parliamentarian, Mr. Speaker, has three bites of the cherry to determine 
how the estimates impact his or her constituency. Three biases. And you can, of course, confirm this, Mr. Speaker. First, the estimates are perused to determine whether provision is made for constituency specific projects. Perhaps I can conceptualize in my case. I will pick up the estimates and go through the estimates to see if your fourth south is mentioned. And I will then pay particular attention to the capital estimates to see whether there are any projects in the capital estimates for the fourth south um, in the ensuing budget recycle. That's the first thing that I would do. And I'm betting you, Mr. Speaker, every parliamentarian does the same thing. I mean, even though some of these parliamentarians, all of these parliamentarians are are members of the cabinet of ministers and know and should have a fair idea of what is in there, but they don't know what the civil servants will decide at the end of the day if the power is conceded to them to decide. And so they anxiously open the estimates to see if there are, there are specific projects of the constituency that is, that is mentioned. The second bite comes when individual ministers speak to explain how they intend to use the block allocations made to their ministries. Now here you wait patiently, very patiently, to see if your constituency is identified and if your constituency is mentioned. You listen. And may I add, Mr. Speaker, may I add, Mr. Speaker, that is one of the reasons I speak late in the debate, in this particular debate. Because I prefer to wait to hear what the particular ministers are going to say about my constituency and how they plan to spend the allocations they have and what they have in mind for my constituency. I told you that so, I put. <laughs> but I'll come to you. So, Mr. Speaker, the statements of ministers become very important to decipher the estimates. Because as I said, you want to find out what are the plans of individual ministries. Now, so I want to disabuse the honorable members of the belief that I am in the business of seeking to trap the member from Miku South by speaking just when he might want to speak or or whatever the case is. Um, the fact of the matter is that's not my concern at all. I mean, that's a matter of him. I wait to see what ministers have to say about their plans to my constituency. That's my, ob that's my objective. That's the purpose. And he might want to feel that he has comfort, um, he has comfort um, from that statement only to say, I, I would tell him, that he's flying in the face of tradition because, you see, um, a leader of the opposition has to demonstrate that he is worthy of his spurs and that he can jump on his feet and debate on his feet at all times. And if you have had estimates for a whole week at your disposal, then very, very, very clearly, then very, very clearly, Mr. Speaker, very, very clearly, Mr. Speaker, that... No, 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 you're a little misguided, but I'm not going to take you on. I will not take you on just yet. Although I, I want to tell you that if you provoke me and open the door, you'll regret it. Don't go there. So, um, but you see, it's true you can't change history, but the most serious offense you can commit is to lie about history. It's very serious. Okay, now, having said that, Mr. Speaker, having said that, the third, the third bite of the cherry, or if you prefer, comes when the budgetary statement or the policy statement is delivered. It's an important bite, Mr. Speaker, because the policy statement con contains the surprises of the budget, contains the surprise of the budget, and the Minister of Finance may announce projects which may not have been covered in the estimates and which may, of course, be financed by extra budgetary means, for example, through parastatals and state agencies. So if you have no hope or little hope under the first two bites, then you'll now look forward to the third bite to see 
if the hope you are denied finds expression in the third bite. So that is why this process is so important. Now, in my case, Mr. Speaker, I do not have any of those responsibilities. And Mr. Speaker, as a backbencher, I may want to reflect on the philosophy and trajectory of the estimates of revenue and expenditure, the economic prospect, prospects offered by the data presented in the estimates. <clears throat> However, Mr. Speaker, on this occasion, I will say a little about the philosophy and data underpinning the estimates, but rather I will focus solely and exclusively on my constituency here for South. And I am also responding to my constituents who always say to me that you take on this larger responsibility of reflecting on the budget, um, but not often do you speak in the detail that you need to speak about your constituency. Today, I accede to their demand and to their request, and therefore I will focus exclusively on my constituency here for South. I have ample opportunity to reflect on these issues on the third bite of the cherry, the policy debate, then I will speak to wider issues, I mean, the policy, the direction of the country, and how justifiable are the approaches that we are taking to the development of the country. You see, Mr. Speaker, sometimes we have strange motives for, for what we do, but I would say I sense an urgency, Mr. Speaker. I sense an urgency. At my age, you suddenly realize that three years is not a long time in the scheme of things. I mean, in July, two years will be gone, and three years are left. For a child waiting for another birthday or Christmas, or a young, or, or a young man or woman in love, it's eternity. You know, it's eternity, but if you're in love, you have to wait for three years. Why are you laughing, young man? <laughs> it's, an, it's an eternity to wait, to wait. And you know, I can, if you remember when you were a child, I mean, to wait for another birthday, it took so long, and the toys at Christmas, it took so long. But at 72, Mr. Speaker, at 72, it's absolutely no time at all. As the late Owen Arthur used to say, um, to us repeatedly, at that age you are in the departure lounge. And so we constantly have to be cognizant of that, um, of that reality while we take our seats in the departure lounge. So Mr. Speaker, you understand, I hope, the broader context and broader background that I am going to raise some of these issues. Now, do not get me wrong, Mr. Speaker. I want you to hear loud and clear, Mr. Speaker, that I am content and at peace with my political life as it is right now. I am. But I do believe that in this parliamentary cycle, it is a perfect opportunity to reflect and to contribute to shaping the political responsibilities of backbenchers in parliament and without being presumptuous at all, and I ask for forgiveness of anybody who thinks that I am presumptuous, I just ask who better politician or what better politician than myself to discuss or raise this, this, this issue. And I see the member for Castries North nodding his head in approval, and I suspect the point at common that we have um, is decision making regarding who goes into a cabinet, who does not go into a cabinet. I've had the experience of leaving elected members out of my cabinet in part to answer our constitutional requirements, for example, to appoint a deputy speaker, and in doing so, face the disappointment, anger, and even trenchant comments from those individuals and their supporters. I've had that experience, and some of it has been very, 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 very unkind. Very unkind. And no matter what explanation is offered to those affected individuals, 
they see no reason or wisdom to the decisions. But, you know, you know, the passage of time, maturity may help in these matters. But as I have repeatedly said, it is impossible, Mr. Speaker, for all elected parliamentarians to be ministers. And that is why my own comments have been so harsh when I have said that the practice of promising individual ministerial um, positions before elections is an affront to the constitution of the country and should not be practiced, tolerated, allowed, or encouraged. Cabinet positions should not be the subject of bargaining before a general election. It should never, ever, ever be. Because it attacks the fundamental discretion assigned to the Prime Minister by the constitution of the country. And I keep on asking, what will happen when this parliament increases the number of parliamentarians? We are 17 and it is an affront to our constitution that in this day and age, Mr. Speaker, we cannot move from a number 17 bequeathed to us since independence. 40 years, is it 44 years later, we are still at 17 despite the fact that there are incongruities and unlawfulness in the demarcation of our constituency boundaries. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I've warned before, the time will come when some citizen in this country who insists that the constitution be protected and be observed will find his, hymns, his or her way to the court and ask declarations from the courts in that matter. Because whether we like to hear it or not, these constituency boundaries are unlawful because they fly in the face of the requirements of the constitutional solution. And it is time that this matter be resolved, whether we go to 21 or 23 or whatever number of seats that we need to go to. So, to capture what I'm trying to say, Mr. Speaker, I'm really trying to say this in this, these estimates. I have come to realize that there is need to reflect and de redesign the relationship between a government in office and its backbenchers. And I say this because of my previous experience. I say this because of my current experience. Truth is, Mr. Speaker, we have had little experience in shaping such relationships because there have been so few backbenchers, so to speak. And as you know, nearly all members are absorbed in cabinet for one reason or another. So we don't have the experience to inform our political behavior and political practice, but we have to correct it. Some years ago, Mr. Speaker, I finalized the drafting of a code of ministerial conduct for the government of Grenada. At the time, I had done a code of cabinet procedures for them and also a code of ministerial behavior. And somewhere at the back of my mind, I know that we had approved a code of cabinet procedures for the um, government of St. Lucia. Whether it's observed, I don't know. Um, but also, mention was made of this ministerial code. The code established rules of ministerial behavior, identified situations which breed conflicts of interest, and crucially, how ministers should handle parliamentarians who are not members of the cabinet. For example, the court made provision for cabinet members to alert a sitting parliamentarian of all official engagements and appearances in the constituencies of parliamentarians, the awarding of contracts, and the duties of senior management to inform parliamentarians of actions in their constituencies. Now, Mr. Speaker, don't get me wrong, you know. I'm not suggesting that a ministerial code should um, say that when ministers or parliamentarians are on, shall we say, a social frolic or engage in extracurricular activities, that they should report to the sitting parliamentarian that these things are happening. But the truth is, um, Mr. Speaker, I mean, my experience, I become aware of these extracurricular activities from time to time in my constituency. And I have, in the past, privately raised these unusual visits to my constituency for one reason or the other. And while I am 
on this. <laughs> this, is because, this is a very serious debate. And why on this, I want to make a collateral point, Mr. Speaker. I seriously want to suggest to the Prime Minister and member for Castries that he directs his cabinet secretary to remind all permanent secretaries that when parliamentarians write to them, they have a duty to acknowledge and respond to these letters. There seem to be a culture in the public service of ignoring correspondence from parliamentarians, and that applies whether the parliamentarian is a member of the governing party or whether the parliamentarian is in opposition, no matter as unpalatable as those letters could be. And Mr. Speaker, I speak from experience that letters I have written to permanent secretaries go unanswered. But let me say this. Of course, Mr. Speaker, where a letter comes from a parliamentarian in his legal capacity, that is a different matter altogether, as there is recourse in a different forum. So when you see a lawyer sends a letter to a permanent secretary, you understand, Mr. Speaker, then sometimes the lawyer is very happy the permanent secretary never replies. Because then you deal with that in another forum. And sometimes it could be very helpful, I assure you, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, against that background, I will now come to some of my um, comments regarding this budget. And I want to be clear at the outset, Mr. Speaker. On my mind are the events in Devote South in the last few weeks. New legislation, which I shall come to you in a few minutes. And of course, Mr. Speaker, the presence of the RSS. And I am now, Mr. Speaker, attempting to brace myself for the <clears throat> inevitable funerals which will ensue in the next few days. And <clears throat> I have had in my time to experience very emotional funerals. And, uh, I mean, I can never forget the, the funeral of the victims some months you know, in, 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 in Miku. That one was extraordinary, was painful, was intense. It, it tore at all our hearts and our beings. And so, in the next few weeks in Beaufort, devotions will be paying homage to those, to those victims, those who died um, by the gun. So, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that these estimates of revenue expenditure were, well, were prepared well before these events. And the question then becomes that apart from what may be in the, in the estimates of, expenditure, of revenue and expenditure for the South, how will the programs in these estimates bring comfort to the people of the South after those events? That's, that's, for me, a question of preoccupation. Because all of us in this house know that we are dealing with an unprecedented event. And we know that Beaufort South is at a critical and delicate point of its existence. These days, we are on the lips of, of everyone. Everything you hear, Beaufort South, Beaufort, Beaufort this, Beaufort that. Never mind that the issue of crime is a phenomenon experienced by all St. Lucians throughout all communities in this country. We have had mass killings in other communities before, a point repeatedly made by the member for Castries East. Yet, Beaufort South is always singled out, not in the manner that you are hearing from the member from Castries North, Mr. Speaker, but of course, in a totally different manner. So we are the focus of interest. And as I said two weeks ago, as a result of the events in Dufort South, an act described the Suppression of Escalated Crime Act was enacted by this parliament. 
And earlier this sitting, the Minister for National Security laid before this parliament an order described as suppression of escalated crime police designation of your force mm -hmm. south as an escalated crime area order statutory instrument number 31 of 2023. So, if you thought south is never far away and we have the unique distinction of encouraging the passage of this legislation and of course being declared the first area in St. Lucia to attract a statutory order um, to contain so-called escalated crime. And I know that the portions are wounded. I know their pain. And I know that there is a shame that they have to confront and they are seeking to deal with. In my pronouncements following the events in the Fort South, Mr. Speaker, I said that the events in the Fort South may well be a watershed. A moment in our history, a moment in our affairs when perhaps we need to take a pause and to reflect. Of course, it's a watershed for the people of the Fort South who must face our collective pain and repudiate the past and the events of the past. Secondly, it is a watershed for the police to change their approach to policing in Viafort South and to work to win the trust and confidence of the people of Viafort South. I did not say it then, but unquestionably, Mr. Speaker, it is also a watershed for the government how it deals with the challenges and issues facing the Fort South now and in the next few weeks and months. Already, Mr. Speaker, the police have understood what they ha that they have to build bridges. I commend Deputy Commissioner of Police Shari for taking the lead by engaging users of the fisheries complex to clean up the complex, the site of three or four killings in the past few years. For the past two Sundays, DP, DCP Shallery has joined users of the facility to debush the area. I commend that. And it is exceedingly pleasing to see him and other police officers working side by side with the users of the facility in a joint endeavor to debush and to clean up and restore some degree of security to the place. I will have to say more about the fisheries complex in a moment too, but I want to, to emphasize this because on the one hand, while their actions are exposing the vulnerability of people who use the complex, exposing the fact that the bush in the area provided a haven for the assailants, at the same time, the cleaning up has indicated that urgent works are necessary and immediate to be able to restore some degree of security to that site. But in my meandering of the estimates, Mr. Speaker, apart from the mention of funding for St. Jude's Hospital, in the allocation to the Ministry of Economic Development and in the allocation to the Ministry of Wellness, etc. And uh, apart from these, Mr. Speaker, and of course the remnants of the water project that has a long history um, on the public utilities and so on, there are no specific projects identified in the estimates of the Fort South. None. None. But don't get me wrong, Mr. Speaker, I don't get me wrong. This is not to say that you fought South is not the beneficiary of several commendable initiatives by the government. And I'm going to applaud the government. The government has agreed to establish an office of civil status to handle civil status documents, the registration of births and deaths, the issuance of birth certificates, rectification of records, and the like, 
Although I heard um, the minister speaking about a mobile unit for passports, etc., this is an interesting development, and I wait for further details on that particular unit because my impression was that an office would have been established in Beaufort for people in the south to access for applications for passports. But I want to pause momentarily, Mr. Speaker, to say that I am deeply concerned that there is mounting frustration among all citizens over the issuance and resolution of civil status records. The people of the South suffer greatly by irrational requests and constant visits to the office in Castries to resolve these matters. We may need to revisit legislation to protect citizens, especially the poor of the people of this country, against the seemingly enduring passion of public officers to make life impossible for these poor people. Mr. Speaker, you might be tempted to say I am exaggerating. Am I? A day does not go by if you do not see long lines outside the civil status registry in Castries. Why is this happening in this country eight years after we set up that office and eight years after amendments was made to the legislation? Can I tell you, Mr. Speaker, the number of times an unsuspecting citizen had to be asked to travel up to Castries for some information? And some of the information that is being asked is simply bizarre. And I believe that the government has to ask the Attorney General to look into the legislation to widen again the discretionary powers of civil servants to resolve these problems on their own because they are asking for impossible records, records that do not exist, frustrating ordinary people, driving ordinary people to say the worst things about government and the services that it offers to people. How can you be harassing an applicant to rectify his birth records about a birth, birth certificate of a father who has never registered or baptized? What irrationality is this? What do you tell such people, Mr. Speaker? We have no answers. And I'm concerned because every time I pass by those lines, I see a fortune standing there in line waiting for some record. I'm tired of it, Mr. Speaker. I'm really tired of it. I'm in front. It's not fair. But I come to that. It's not fair for the citizens of this country. And then I return, however, after that little digression to my commendation. Only recently, following a meeting with the Prime Minister and Member for Castries East and the Minister of Commerce, the Member of Soufre. The Prime Minister agreed to establish an office of the Department of Commerce to grant citizens of the South access to information and services, particularly, Mr. Speaker, in respect of the grants and loans for small businesses for which funding is allocated in these estimates and which the member for Soufre addressed. The intention, Mr. Speaker, initially was that persons who could have accessed the um, the constituency office of the parliamentary representative to assist in filling those forms. I made it quite clear I don't want that to happen in my constituency office. Why, Mr. Speaker, for very simple reason. This is a government service and it should be accessed by all and no one should feel uncomfortable or intimidated coming to my political office, my constituency office, um, for support and assistance. And it is best that they go to a desk operated by the ministry to assist with these, with, with these matters. And I'm very happy that the Prime Minister made a decision that he would ensure that a desk is established in one of the buildings in VA4 to facilitate this. And then, Mr. Speaker, there are the ongoing initiatives of which the people of VA4 South will be eternally grateful. Indeed, some of the ongoing initiatives have their origins in the predecessor Labour government. For example, STEP. And I'm happy that we are not ashamed anymore to use the word step, that we understand there's a place for step in the economic life of this country, 
and we must use the STEP program wisely to benefit distressed persons. Then the return of the laptop program organized by this government, I give praise, I give thanks, not only because it was an initiative which I championed, but I know even if there is abuse, that the benefits would be huge and immense for the children of this country. The $500 bursary to parents um, of students who will be accessing secondary school, again, a previous initiative, and I am happy and pleased that parents can get access to this, although I have to say quietly and surreptitiously, Mr. Speaker, there are some parents abusing those payments. And we may need to, to, to develop a mechanism to prevent such abuses. <coughs> then there is the support under the whole program. And I must say, of course, the former government had its fair share of utilizing the whole program for all kinds of things. My goodness, Mr. Speaker, I just wish they had brought me in um, to some of the programs that they had um, in their constituencies, apart from the tokenism. But the point is that these programs are now established and entrenched, and people are now beneficiaries of these programs. There is, of course, a housing program, housing assistance program in initiated by this government, although not, they're not the first, because the former Labour government did have a housing program that focused on the elderly. But of course, um, of course, yes, millions were spent. But this is good that we have this program to back up and the way it is, and the government has to be commended. And then I heard the member for Castries North this morning saying how much praise St. Lucia has earned for its programs of social protection across the region. And inevitably, I smiled, and of course he didn't go as far as I wanted him to go, because we were the great pioneers of these various programs, and, of, and succeeding governments, Unfortunately, of course, denatured some of those programs, compromised some of those programs, but, but we have been able to revive and ensure they're intact. Although, Mr. Speaker, when the time is ripe, I want to deal with this, with this issue of the, the, the dependency syndrome that is now in this country. Um, whether it is expressed by poor people in distant communities or by the business community, I want to deal with that, and I'm hoping that occasion will arise soon. Well, you see, Mr. Speaker, I have said that three years is a short time. And so if you find I am a little unorthodox, it is only because I want to say the things I have not been able to say in previous years and to say it as I want, without anybody trying to direct me how I should say it and when I should say it. So, Mr. Speaker, you should expect, I'm giving you good warning, more of this. And I'm sorry that the leader of the opposition has just made an exit. I'll tell you why. <laughs> And this is, this is the point about a St. Lucia Labour Party administration that needs restating. This is, this is the point that I want to, to restate. The St. Lucia Labour Party has always understood that development must be equitable, it must be balanced, it must be fair, and it reaches every corner of this country. Equality of access, and treatment are not just legal concepts for lawyers. They are political tools for politicians. They are articles of faith, articles of belief. We must be fair, honest, and equitable in our treatment, not just between and among citizens, but also between geographic areas, between communities, between North and South, between East and West, and of course, between constituencies. Equity lies at the heart of the philosophy of the St. Lucia Labor Party. These are not just legal concepts, as I said. They are social and ideological concepts. And certainly these concepts guided me when the people of St. Lucia gave me the opportunity to shape the development agenda of St. Lucia over the years. That is why, Mr. Speaker, simple little things matter. That is why, Mr. Speaker, one of the first things we did was to bring electricity to the people of Bhutto when they had been denied electricity by a form by former UWP administrations on the grounds 
that people were abandoning Bhutto and they were no longer a relevant community. And you know what has happened, Mrs. Bigger? When electricity was brought to the people of, um, to the people of Bhutto, almost immediately, Mrs. Speaker, fortunes changed, land became expensive, and Bhutto became um, sought after. So we brought electricity to Bhutto, expanded access to water and electricity, made it possible for every child to receive a secondary education, sought to create special programs for the poor to bring them into the mainstream of the social and economic life of this country. And Mr. Speaker, there is a continuity, the continuity, the continuum, so to speak. It is the same ideological concept that guides the member for Castries East when he insists that all constituencies must benefit from the CDP vote in the estimates. This concept of equity is part of the ideological life or ideological inheritance of this administration. He too will remember well the battle in my own cabinet when I insisted that all constituencies must benefit under this program. Never mind the statements made by the former member for Castries Southeast because he got a land share. And I have in fact prepared a document with a list of projects that went to Castries Southeast, but I have not go on through them. Again, I'm waiting for the right opportunity when I'm in the right mood to do so. So, Mr. Speaker, equality of treatment is a fundamental ideological pillar of the governing party. Now, Mr. Speaker, what I want to do is to take the opportunity to tell the opposition to take a page from the book of this administration and give SLC, SLP supporters in their constituencies contract on the CDP. They must not only give the contracts to UWPs, they must share it in the spirit of equity, equality, and fairness. And as for you, keep quiet because I have a list of all the persons you have given contracts to. I shadow, never forget. Never forget that Swazel Saldibas is a community and constituency dear to me. I was born in Swazel, as you know, in Rivadori. My family is from Saldibas. I have a little house I go and hide there from, from time to time. And I know you have passed by to look at it. You refuse, you refuse to repair the road. Well, this is because they, they used to send the UWP to go and look at the house, you know, because after elections, they say I was hiding there. I mean, the kinds of things that I've gone through, Mr. Speaker. If I, I don't know why these days in my, I, I don't know why in these days I can still laugh, you know, when I think of the things that I've had to, the things I've had to endure over, over time. So, Mr. Speaker, against this background, how one looks at the estimates, against this, this background of interventions in the constituency prior to the estimates, Against this background, the concept of equity in the allocation of budgetary resources, I want to turn to my constituency and to restate, as I call it, the agenda for my constituency. Put differently, let me just touch on the issues affecting... Member of the South, South, you have 10 minutes left. Are you serious? Again? Extremely serious. <laughs> uh, I think I need an hour, at least, if I may, Mr. Speaker. Let me see. If I have ruffled enough feathers to allow me to speak to another. Member for the Henry North. Mr. Speaker, I want to invoke standing order 4210 in order to allow the member for Viewfort South an additional hour within which to complete his presentation. Honourable members, the question is that standing order 3210 be invoked to allow the member for Viewfort South an additional hour in which to complete this presentation. I now put a question, as many as of that opinion say aye. As many as of a country opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it, leave is granted. I didn't hear the aye loud enough, Mr. Speaker, but you know, <laughs> but you know, Mr. Speaker, um, I thank the member for Denry North for his generosity. Last time he was not generous, but I'm glad he is today. Now. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to restate what are the priorities for us in the Fort South and to articulate 
the needs of my, my constituents. For me, the first item has to do with the deplorable conditions of the roads of your first south. Mr. Speaker, I have said time and time again that the roads of Cedar Heights in Beaufort are in a deplorable condition. I can offer no excuse, no more excuses to the constituents. I have no more excuses. I can't invoke any other excuses at this stage. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker. And you know, Mr. Speaker, a road that I've been begging to reconstruct is a main cantonment road above the brewery going into the middle of cantonment. I mean, he said, like a, that road is like a dance hall of potholes. You know what I mean? You bob and weave, bob and weave, bob and weave, bob and weave. And then in you go. I mean, it's, it's, it's the holes, uh, Mr. Speaker. I mean, the number of holes, etc. And every time the ministry in the South is approached, Mr. Speaker, every time, the usual story, they don't give us resources, we don't have resources. I have drawn to the attention of the Minister of Infrastructure the need to complete the road in Bruceville and why it is important to complete that road in Bruceville. Because you know the people of Bruceville have suffered cycles of punishment when we have lost the elections. The community, the roads in the Larishes community are all in disarray and getting worse day by day, no attention paid to these community roads. And then at least the road to Latuni, heavily used for funerals, heavily used by all and sundry, from the north, from the south, from the east to the west. We started to look after it by paving a concrete road from the St. Jude Highway right across to the top of Diamon, but the rest now just potholes and really I, I don't know Mrs. Speaker how we rational rationalize our attitudes to these things. For me Mrs. Speaker you see a, a, a cemetery it's a sacred place. You have to treat it with a certain amount of, of reverence and I believe a member for Castries North is appreciating what I'm saying because he knows that it was an SLP government that started the investment in a shock cemetery to build roads inside a shock cemetery and build a wall. And people didn't understand why. And today, I'm very pleased at what I see in shock cemetery because there's now some order. The Castries Constituency Council has a dedicated team, etc. And we are beginning to treat shock cemetery with some respect, although there are now problems because sooner or later the sea will claim the dead that has trespassed on the beaches. Um, a chop. So we need to attend to this and I look forward to the minister's contribution to say what he plans about cemeteries. Now, that apartment, Mr. Speaker, the few four town streets, very few of those streets were paved in the past and there are many that now require repaving. When the um, member for Castries East was uh, the minister of infrastructure, he did um, ensure that the main street in Beaufort, Clark Street, was paved, but we never paid intention, attention to the remaining roads. Perhaps the most egregious thing is the unfinished construction of the St. Jude Highway from the brewery to the entrance, um, from the brewery to the junction with the Labrie Beaufort Highway, and then, of course, from the brewery to Larishes. Mr. Speaker. It's egregious because the understanding was that that road would have been completed to bring relief to the heavily used road um, into the industrial estates and, of course, to Oshie and surrounding areas. For reasons that I do not want to go into at this stage, I understood a decision was made to stop the road by the brewery because of a reallocation of resources, it meant that the people of Beaufort paid the price. And you know what is very sad, Mr. Speaker? <coughs> Beaufortians are now looking for roads that they can detour
to get in, into the fort and to and from the fort because of the conditions of, of that road. Now, Mr. Speaker, I really don't know what more to, I can say about this. Now, when I look at the capital budget for the Ministry of Infrastructure, I see provision, for example, if you look at page 583, Mr. Speaker, made for the rehabilitation of McDonnell Road, construction of Austin Road, Mark and Denry Roads, Grosley and Castries North Roads project. I don't see anything from the fourth side. Now, bear in mind what I said earlier on. If you look and you don't see any reference to your roads, then what you do is that you wait for the pronouncements from the minister to say what roads he intend to tackle in your, in your constituencies. But I missed part of his presentation, but not that part dealing with infrastructure investment, and so did not hear anything about roads in default. And so, Mr. Speaker, you will understand when I say that perhaps I now have to wait for the budget policy statement. It is distressing that no road is featured in the Fort South. Nowhere is there any indication that the Fort South is a priority for the Ministry of Infrastructure. And to the credit of the member for Castries North, he did say his permanent secretary will engage me with priorities. Sorry, the chief engineer, the permanent secretary, well, he's a little remote. Um, Oh, I see. Um, but I would say this, that the chief engineer was supposed to give me her list of priorities. And as, she, as fate would have it, perhaps coincidence, I got a message from her this morning asking me if I had received an email she had sent me. I checked my emails and told her, no, I had received no such emails. So maybe there might be redemption, maybe there might be redemption, and I might get the email with a list of priorities, but I just hope that she has the right priorities. I now turn to the other vex issue, the fisheries complex. Last year, Mr. Speaker, an allocation of 1.4 million was made under the head of repair sufficient facilities. This allocation for 2022 was never, ever disbursed. What I do understand when I queried is that an allocation, an original disbursement of $400,000 was allowed, but redirected to another fisheries project because of pressing commitments where that is concerned. Now, you know, Mr. Speaker, I have been trying to digest this and, 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 and if I am speaking on truth, the member for Denry North is next to me because then we South, sorry, because he supplied me with the information. We spoke about it. You know, Mr. Speaker, I have been trying to understand for years what really enters the minds of public servants when they make decisions like allocating money from one head to the next. And when they're going to use money allocated for one project or another project. I accept overriding issues, for example. I accept the reality of cash flow. You know, when you don't bring in enough money to pay your commitments. But you know what? I'm beginning to think that senior decision makers, senior public officers, need to go and travel around the country into constituencies to demand to understand what politicians are talking about, you know. They are involved in paper transactions, book transactions, totally oblivious to the needs and demands of people. And they do not understand what people are going through. The politician is the interlocutor between people and them, trying to get them to understand the realities of daily lives of, of the individuals who make up the country. Because they're, 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 they're distant, unconcerned, far away apart, divorced from those realities. And then they engage in these paper transactions and causing great, great harm, not just to sitting politicians, but to the constituents of these politicians. This financial year, Mr. Speaker, there's an allocation of $711,000, again, see page 580 of the estimates, substantially lower than the previous year. The Minister for Fisheries, sitting next to me, the member for Denry South, 
explain to me that this amount of salary is to be shared around four facilities. And my mathematics tells me that if you divide that by four, that a dead belly, oh, um, four into seven, one belly, a hundred and something thousand dollars for each facility. Clearly, the impact of any such expenditure in before will be really negligible, inconsequential. We have a job ahead of us. We either save the Beaufort Fisheries facilities or let it go to waste once and for all. That's the reality. Unless there is an urgent intervention, then I'm afraid we're going to lose what was once the best fishing complex in the entire Eastern Caribbean. The last time any substantial work was done was sometime after 2011, when then the then government was able to source some money or some funds from JICA. Fisheries was then under the direction and control of the member for Beaufort North and some token um, adjustments were made to the complex. I'm sure the member for Beaufort North will remember the installation of some lighting, etc. But he knew, as I knew, that it was mere tokenism at the time, insufficient to deal with the problems that we had. What has happened, Mr. Speaker, is that the re recent effort to debush the facilities exposes the urgent works which need to be undertaken. The fence which once provided security lies on the ground, prostrate, totally destroyed. And I just want to emphasize, uh, given the urgency, funds are required to reconstruct that fence. Otherwise, all the work to debush the area, to clean up around the area, will be of no benefit or of no consequence. And it is pointless, I'm told, to use my CDB funds because CDB funds were never intended for that and it's unfair, unfair to me to have to use the CDB funds I get which can build a mile of a road to be able to, to do something like this, Mr. Speaker. Then there's the issue of lighting. The cooperative has been begging for the installation of lights in the facilities, begging, literally begging. And Mr. Speaker, I am very happy that they got in fact in touch with the Minister of Infrastructure um, to, to present their, their claim in this matter. And I'm, all I can do, Mr. Speaker, is to read out the email which I received from the operations manager, Kejiana Tusa Shari, who's a senator in, the, in this parliament. Honorable Kenny Anthony, although this is an ongoing and long-standing issue, we can well appreciate the added agitation to get it on the way in short time. The issue of poor lighting has existed for a while, and the co-op has over time made great strides in bearing the cost of electrical troubleshooting and purchase of lamps, which has helped significantly. However, they are woefully inadequate, and the recent criminal activity has created a greater urgency to improve on the lighting needs. Therefore, we are requesting your assistance in the provision of approximately 15 lamps and technically assistance from the Ministry of Infrastructure or by way of support of remittance to a consultant to strengthen the lighting issue in a holistic manner. We look forward to your indulgence on the above matter. But following an email asking her whether she had made a demand of the Ministry of Infrastructure, she engaged the Minister of Infrastructure and I wait to see what the result will be. Mr. Speaker, I want to repeat something I said. In the past four years, this, this facility has been the, the scene of, of four killings. Among them have been my friends and supporters. And on moments like this, I always remember the colorful and notorious character by the name of Banfair, who was stabbed in, in that facility. And every Vuforshan, and wholesale and retail, retailers of fish and fishing products will remember him, I'm sure. Now, Mr. Speaker, the elephant in the room, and I just realized that I'm using a term once used by the member from the South, and, and this is rare that I will use a term used by the member from the South. 
Um, very, very, very rare. Um, absolutely very rare. But Mr. Speaker, I don't know if you remember when that term, and this is a little digression, just to tease your memory, and I see the member of Swazil is watching me intently. I do have a formidable memory. I don't know if you remember, Mr. Speaker, the famous dialogue that took place um, over the replacement of candidates in the Nibu South constituency. <coughs> When the, when the then member um, said, when the then member of the United Workers Party, who wasn't a parliamentarian, said regarding his own selection that the elephant in the room was whether he would have been allowed to enter the constituency to represent him. Do you remember that, Mr. Speaker? Remember that? Good. I'm glad to see you have a memory outside of the walls of this parliament. So I'm going to use that term this afternoon, the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, Mr. Speaker, is the issue of resolving the management of the facilities. As I've expressed to the member for Denry South, the facilities are on autopilot. No one is in charge of the fishing facilities in Beaufort. And that's the crux of the problem. So everyone does what they want to do. The term has come to take a decision. As I've said before, there are only three options that are available. The first, Mr. Speaker, is to cede the facility to all the cooperatives in the South, let them form a company and manage the facility. I am told, however, that the cooperatives do not favor that approach. My attitude was to give the cooperatives a grant to start them off, but no funds after that grant. The second option is the management by the government. And let me say, I don't support that. That's another dead end because of the experiences that we have had with the fisheries complexes, and it makes no sense no sense whatsoever, Mr. Speaker, um, for the government to get involved in the management of that complex anymore, given what has happened. In fact, in the same vein, I had to say to the member for Castry, for Denry South, I was most astonished when um, a subsidy was given to the St. Lucia Marketing Board because I can't recall any farming organization that ever received more subsidies than the St. Lucia Marketing Board. But one, only can, one can only be an onlooker in these matters, and we have to wait to see what that will yield. The third option is the lease to a private sector operator. And I want again to suggest that the fisheries facility be advertised for lease to be managed by a private sector operator. Not in the original concept of the former government, because that don't make sense. That is trouble. That is absolute trouble. But an independent private sector operator who is willing to invest and take the gamble to do so. We need to find management for the facility. And by the way, forget the Ministry of Agriculture. Forget them entirely. They are not the authority to be managing the complex because they are part of the problem. Now, Mr. Speaker, I now come to the other VEX issue, the issue of the Proud Program and land in U4. Mr. Speaker, may I add a juncture and ask you how much time I have? Um, 50 minutes, I think. 15? 50. Oh, 50. Okay, right, Mr. Speaker. Well, very good, that's good news. Mr. Speaker, I turn to the PROD program and the issue of accessibility of land in Beaufort to the people of Beaufort. Mr. Speaker, Land is a burning issue in Beaufort. It's an enduring issue. And try as I have, try as I have, I cannot convince those who are responsible for managing lands in Beaufort what the problem is. I will restate for the benefit of this house. Beaufortians do not own their community. It is the only community in Beaufort where the people who reside in the community do not own the lands. 
Euphortians are not part of the domestic economy of Euphorts. Many of them cannot buy and sell land as they want. Why, Mr. Speaker? Viewfort is sequestrated in that narrow neck of land between Mula Sheik to the south and, of course, the airport boundary to the north and the areas of Larry Shoes to the north. In Viewfort town itself, most of the land is owned by the two churches, the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church. And I have issued a call and indication to them that I want to dialogue with them with a view to persuading the government to allow the government to purchase these lands and to subdivide these lands to give people title to the lands. In fact, it is part of my manifesto pledge to the people of the South. Then, of course, Mr. Speaker, there is the issue of the wider before. You know, Mr. Speaker, People ask me, why is it that before people get angry? Why are they angry sometimes? You know, Mr. Speaker, answer is simple, or one of the answers. All the land in Beaufort is being sold out to people outside of Beaufort. All of it. You go to see the Heights, you go um, to Contonement, the majority of house lots have been sold to people, whether they are from Miku, from Denry, from Castries, from Soufre, etc. The land is gone. People in Beaufort, therefore, cannot buy the land. There are very few of Beaufortians who have land in these areas. Very, very, very few who can afford this land. But they watch as outsiders come into their community to be part of their community. Can you therefore understand why, Mr. Speaker, that they would be constantly knocking on the door of Invest St. Lucia, constantly? Why? Why it is a problem? Why I have tried to suggest that a dedicated parcel of land be subdivided and allocated to allow the people of Beaufort an opportunity to own lands in their own community so they can feel part of their community, that they belong to it? It is against that background, Mr. Speaker, that the Proud Program was so critical and so essential to the people of Euphort and was such an important limb of the policy of former Labour governments, Mr. Speaker. Why? Because with the Proud Program, we were able to make a start with the people of Dermon and La Richouse and La Tuni parcel out the lands and sell it to them and offer to them the land at bargain prices, Mr. Speaker, based on the number of years. And of course, the former government, the former UW government, never happy with that arrangement, never, ever, ever happy with it. You did not. You did not. As a matter of fact, I can tell you, very few persons ever got title on a proud, proud program. And you know, zero. You were, you were zero. It existed only only in name, only in name. I don't know why a government would want to do this because owning land is the most powerful tool of empower, economic empowerment that you can get. When you own land, you enter the economy, you can buy and sell, you can mortgage. That's a, and you know, one of the things that I've seen, Mr. Speaker, a lot of the parents in Larry Shoes who now have these lands, that is what they are mortgaging to send their children to school, to universities. But what has happened? The program now has, 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 has languished. And you know, for me, one of the most painful episodes, Mr. Speaker, painful, I can't find a better word to describe it, is the plight of the people of Bruceville. And I'm sorry, there are people in this house who may well be tired of hearing my complaints this afternoon. And they should. Because that's the agenda that is going to shape me in the next few months. Mr. Speaker, do you know that twice, twice in the life of the former Labour government, attempts were made to subdivide the lands in Bruceville for the people of Bruceville, Mr. Speaker, twice. And each time those plans were abandoned and the people of Bruceville denied an opportunity to own the little piece of land that they occupy in Bruceville. And you want to find out why the people of Bruceville sometimes are so angry? Do you know now, Mr. Speaker, what is happening? Every living day I get messages on my phone 
Every Wednesday I go to my constituency. People want to vacate and abandon Bruceville and look to go elsewhere. What am I supposed to tell them? I can't send them to invest in Lucia. Because they are the hardest not to crack. They don't understand the sociological realities of the town or the community. All they exist to do in Beaufort is to make money by selling the land to the people of Beaufort. That's all they do. And I'm sorry if I'm blunt, but it's nothing new. It's nothing new. They don't come up with a coherent plan to benefit the people of Beaufort. They don't. And I keep on hammering, and I keep on begging, I keep on pleading, I keep on cajoling, I, I keep on persuading. Do you know what difference it would make if Invest St. Lucia and if the Ministry of Housing says these are, this area is dedicated for the resettlement of the people of Beaufort to give them an opportunity to own their community and be part of the development of their community. Why? And to put things in context, every time we were about to start the process of demarcating, subdividing, and of course, sending um, persons into Bruceville, every time, every time we were about to do this, Mr. Speaker, elections came, we were interrupted by elections, and all the plans were abandoned. So once again, the people of Bruceville are left without any crutches, without any support, without any opportunities. And I am hoping and had hoped that in this cycle we would have resolved this problem. And I understand, of course, that the Proud Project is currently engaged in demarcating um, lands at cantonment, surveying lands at cantonment for the people of cantonment. <laughs> and another, pro another project that is over 10 years overdue, Mr. Speaker, 10 years. And you know, I don't know what's wrong with this country. I, I don't understand it sometimes. Can somebody explain to me why we take 10 years for a matter like that? And then, and then, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm not sure that Proud is getting the kind of support that it needs to get to engage in the land re um, revolution that we need to engage in. We have to empower people. We have to empower people, give them opportunities to, to own land. I'm not saying that Invest and Lucia don't have land programs. I know they're trying, they're busy surveying lands up in the constituency of the member for Castries North. And when Beforeshans come to me, I tell them, go ahead and apply to, to invest in Lucia, but bear in mind it's the constituency of the member for Castries North, so you have to approach him and that, cons sorry, if you fought North. So you have to approach him um, to, to um, get his support and assistance, because it's not my constituency. I can't interfere, and I do, and I don't like people interfering in my constituency, so I don't interfere in other people's constituency. And so, Mr. Speaker, I really would want to find out where we are at. And, and, and may I again plead for the people of Bruceville? May I again ask that a concerted effort be made to allow them to own the land on which they reside, to give them some permanency? Maybe that will help to discourage some of them from wanting to, 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 to disappear from, from, from that area. Now, this is a perfect juncture for me, Mr. Speaker, to touch on the presence of SLASPA and touch again on Invest in Lucia in Beaufort South. In my more distressing moments, Mr. Speaker, and I don't want to offend any of the ministers who are here who have responsibilities for these entities, I seriously wonder whether these two organizations, SLASPA and Invest in Lucia, are blessings or curses on the people of the Fort South. I really wonder, Mr. Speaker. I, I really, really, really wonder. I, I really wonder. And again, I know it will be felt that I'm exaggerating. Um, 
But you know, Mrs. Bigger, you can test it. I ask you to ask any of those entities to identify one major contribution to the people of Ford. One single project that they can identify and say that they did for the people of Ford by virtue of utilizing the property entrusted to the people of Ford. You can't cite one. None can tell you. All invest in Lucia can show is a bus stop by the comprehensive school at Larry Shoes. One bus stop. And for which I had a hell of a hard time to get invested Lucia to agree to construct. I well remember, and I, be, I see the member of Castries is laughing because you see he remembers full well what I had to go through to get that one bus stop built by Invest in Lucia. And this is an entity that all it does is to sell lands in Dufort and extract the income from the sale of lands to do its business. And in the name of justice, you tell me that is fair? You tell me that is equity? Yet for years, Mr. Speaker, that has been a very good Now, you know, Mr. Speaker, a few moments ago, I heard the Minister of Infrastructure speaking eloquently about the environment which greet visitors when they arrive in St. Lucia in Beaufort South. He was eloquent, and I, if I was close by, I might have gone up and given him a handshake and said to him, now, now you know, now you're talking, man. Because he was concerned how this country appears to, the, to visitors and to people coming in. Yet my problem is that one of the greatest offenders who tarnish who tarnish Viewfort environment is in fact Slaspa and of course followed by Investolution. I have spoken in this parliament for years and I've asked that the sale of lands alongside the highway be stopped and that that area be beautified, that a building that is now left on its steel beams be torn down to improve the appearance of the place. And I've asked and suggested Slasgo and Invested we should cooperate. All they do when they call me to their offices and have meetings is understanding and then um, and make promises that never seem to materialize. And of course, you know, these are the same people who look at politicians and say all kinds of things about politicians. And when they have time, of course, they might even direct some choice words at me as well, as if I don't know. You understand, Mr. Speaker? You understand? And then, of course, you're supposed to accept, you, you're supposed to accept those things, you know, but you know, they don't know there's always recourse in these matters. They don't know that. I have also asked the Development Control Authority to put an end to the mining that is taking place on the hill above the airport because it is having consequences for the people of Ufort. I stopped it in 2011. I see the member for, for Ufort North is looking after me because, at me because he knows I stopped it. But as soon as I lost the election, they went back, opening up, and the mining has continued to this day. I don't know how you can allow mining to take place next to an airport like that with all that dust. It is little wonder that people have to go through the things that they, 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 they're going through. And I make no apologies for asking that that area um, along the highway to the airport, there should not be the sale of any lands to any investor in that area, but that land should be left alone. Trees be planted along that land on both sides so that people can have a welcoming impression when they arrive at the airport to or from, from, from the airport. I have not heard a member for um, Castries South, and I may have to ask him to speak a little more loudly, but I know he wouldn't want to take that risk. So, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> routinely, I ask them, the two, to collaborate on this matter. And of course, they ignore me. But you know, you can do so. You can do so. But when I'm ready, it'll be a different matter. 
But there's one recent event which I want to share with this parliament to illustrate the issues which face us, Mr. Speaker. I really want to share it with members of parliament. And I know the member for Castro is a little bit a little uncomfortable. But I also believe that he's a man who understands equity, fairness. I mean, after all, he spent a long time working with me. Eh? Spent a long, I, mean, I didn't teach him all his habits. I enter a disclaimer. But I can tell you, we fashioned some good programs together. We did, so he understands what I'm saying. Now, Mr. Speaker, as I said to you some months ago, I had a meeting with officials of Invest St. Lucia to discuss my complaints about Invest St. Lucia in Beaufort and their role in Beaufort. It was, I guess, the usual rite of passage. You have these meetings after elections. And Ms. Hippolyte is also watching me because she knows of my beef when she was made Minister of Invest St. Lucia and didn't tackle some of the problems which she should have despite my complaints. Invest St. Lucia agreed to construct at the top of New Dock Road in a corner adjacent to, to Massey Supermarket a little block to house refreshment houses for small business operators and to beautify the area. You know, just the corner before you take the lights, there are a lot of little um, huts that have been there. Nobody knows who gave them the authority. And when you see the, a challenge, they say it's me. I've never given anybody, that, that's a usual thing before. Any time that they are challenged, but I know some are given by the former government for sure. The challenge, they say Kenny Anthony, Kenny Anthony, Kenny Anthony, the blame syndrome. I know nothing about it. So, invest in Russia, perhaps in an act of contrition, and to make up, decided that they are interested in funding the construction of, listen to this, Mr. Speaker, a block of, a, a little block of refreshment houses out of wood, I think it was, um, possibly costing 1.3 million to beautify the area because it is ugly. And I'm going to take a, a moment and talk about these little huts we have around the country because this is a matter that we have to deal with. Now, Mr. Speaker, it was there where I was making amends for the neglect of the community I take it over the years of 1.3 1, 1 million pittance. But, you know, I was happy, please. I duly informed the Constituency Council and drawings prepared by a young devotion was sent to invest in Lucia. Well, this is the design, this is the plan, this is what it's, 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 it's going to cost. Now, Mr. Speaker, when I had expected a budgetary announcement on this matter, I have been told by the Constituency Council that invest in Lucia have said that they can no longer finance the project but can only contribute $300,000 towards it. But you know, to put salt in the wounds, Invest in Lucia then says, but in any event, you don't need the $300,000 because Slaspa said that the building can't go up in that corner. Allegedly because of flight consideration. But can you believe this, Mr. Speaker? You have a massive building with that height right there next door. You have CIBC Bank next door. You're telling me that a little set a kiosk around the corner to beautify that corner that you can't put up that kiosk there because of flight considerations? Now, Mr. Speaker, the only thing that is saving me from um, warfare at this stage is to confirm whether that is true or not. Because while I believe that Slaspa is capable of doing that, because that is all they're doing before, nevertheless, I don't see how a sane decision maker could ever, ever make, uh, make a statement like that. And what damage Slaspa has in, imposed on the people of Beaufort South. Mr. Speaker, it's an entity that has always baffled me. I don't know how Slaspa can justify to the people of St. Lucia Especially when now, when I have board members of SLASPA saying that the government must move on the airport, what entity could have justified putting up a terminal building on a flood plain next to a river? And you want to contest a little building around the corner in Viewfort Town, approaching the lights in Viewfort? And this is not the first time Viewfort has suffered 
Everybody remembers the project that had to be abandoned at the southern end of the airport. After millions of dollars were expended by Invest St. Lucia in that area to develop a commercial area, and lands were sold, abandoned because Strasbourg said that it interfered with flight operations. To this day, no one, no one can explain to me how it is in Miami or New York, airplanes have to fly over communities or buildings, and there are no issues about flight path. Yet, in Little St. Lucia, where land is so scarce, a big issue. Mr. Speaker, I am asking in this house, I am asking in this house, Mr. Speaker, that Slasper be asked to issue a clear statement as to what lands in Viewfort are lands which must be left undeveloped because they have to accommodate flight considerations. I will never ever understand these organizations. When, for example, a former government spoke of building a roadside along the airport fence, and actually a particular contractor put his tractor along the fence of the airport and began to clear up alongside the airport, ostensibly, Mr. Speaker, to send an estimate of what it will take to build that road, not one word from Slasper. Why would Slasper want a road to be built next to a high security fence? Baffles me. All to accommodate DSH and, of course, what was supposed to happen on, on the beach next there. You explain to me these irrationalities. You explain to me these irrationalities, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, it is time for Slasper to issue clear guidelines about what the permissible areas of development in view for South are, so that when you see the surrogate invested Lucia, on the other hand, then say they can't do this because Slasper say you can't do it. We have a basis on which to judge the accuracy of what invested Lucia then says. I now tell Mr. Speaker happily to the final item on my agenda today. The issue of the courts financed by the Estimates of, of, of expenditure. Honorable members, will I'm sure remember that I have addressed this issue on previous occasions, save and except, of course, the member for Suzel Soldibus. In fact, I noted that the member for Suzel Soldibus jumped on the bandwagon and raised the issue in his contribution. I don't want it ever to be said that I followed the member for Suzel and Saldivas because I know he plagiarized from me since I had said so on two separate occasions in the House during the debate which he had, he had come, asconded and he said he was sick, the one on the CCJ and I think the subsequent one, you know he stayed away from that one. He said, thanks God I am sick. The kind of thing, I, 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 I know that. <laughs> he was exceedingly happy to be sick on that occasion. But I raised the issue. And so I heard him yesterday, and Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not going to say nothing more to him because I think he got enough pecong yesterday, and I, I live to, and you did get pecong today. He got enough pecong yesterday, and I have to say that he handles it exceedingly well. My only concern was, his, was the fact that he could not discipline the member sitting next to him <laughs> and say to the member next to him that he's not to be interrupted when he's making his contributions to the house. It's one thing to be interrupted by the other side, but it can't be that you allow the person sitting next to you to interrupt you. I would mean I would never allow it, would I? You wouldn't, you wouldn't allow it after all. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm saying going to say nothing. But, but, but again, I urge that immediate attention be, be paid to this, this, to this matter. It's an urgent issue, Mr. Speaker. It is causing serious problems in the second district court, serious problems in the south, and we have to resolve this in a resolute way. Mr. Speaker, perhaps you don't understand what's happening. Over a year, courts in Viewfort are closed. No court proceedings have been held. 
And the explanation is that the former police station that has been rehoused and reconstructed to, um, for the courthouse is, has mold and is a mold issue. And you know, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> you see this mold issue confronting this country? The time has come for the government to get a handle on this mold issue because I'm waiting for the day when you see See that Diana building that the Accountant General's department is in? Oh, they have mold, they have mold already. Well, watch out, you'll soon hear public servants say they want a new building. So I want to find out what's gonna happen when you see this this constant issue of mold come up, etc. 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 There's a way a lot of deals with it, you know. But that's another for another matter. But in view for that was the ex that was the explanation, and everybody it is a lovely and beautiful explanation. It provides a, a perfect rationale for all kinds of sins. And I see the member for Ancillary Canary is frowning as if he does not understand what I'm trying to say by a perfect rationale for all kinds of sins. <laughs> when is it going to end? And it seems to me that the time has come for this issue to be dealt with forcefully by taking it in hand, bring it under some degree of control by perhaps engaging persons who have the skill and who can have the resources to tackle this problem. In similar vein, Mr. Speaker, the Sufre Court has been closed since December 6, 2022. As for the Denry Court, that has been closed for years, and what is happening in Denry is that court proceedings have been held in the courthouse that was constructed at Bordelais. Not for that purpose. Bordelais Courthouse was really intended for persons who are on remand, for cases on remand to be heard, not for general cases. But now it, it has become the courthouse for Denry. Now, Mr. Speaker, I want to spend, spend a moment to stress the importance of dealing with this issue. Mr. Speaker, the whole history of judicial adjudication has rested on the premise that courts must be accessible, that people must see courts in operation, that people must see magistrates dispensing justice. People must feel the salutary effect of judicial proceedings so that the respect that these proceedings deserve can merit attraction. And that is why the old tradition was that you locate these courts initially in police stations, which is a mistake, because police stations, the, the law should not be seen to, seen to be in the bosom of the police force. And that is what I tried to explain to the former government when they wanted to put a, a courthouse in the same building occupied by police officers as a headquarters. You cannot put the law in the bosom of the police. It's utter madness. You cannot do that. But you must have a courthouse that people can relate to. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the matter being addressed by the minister who's assigned responsibility for the courts, but it's not too late. And I plead for a monumental effort to be made to ensure that the system, Mr. Speaker, is addressed and the problem resolved. The second reason, Mr. Speaker, is this. It is situations such as the one I've just described that provide further to the detractors of the Caribbean Court of Justice. They then tell you, but look at this, you can manage um, courts at the low end, magistrates' courts, you don't even have buildings for them, and you want to go to CCJ for justice? As if retaining the Privy Council will solve the problems that you have. We are causing the problems. We are causing the problems by our attitude and reactions to it. So, Mr. Speaker, the fact is access to justice is compromised and denied by these issues, and we must resolve this matter quickly. Mr. Speaker, I will tarry no longer. 
I will tarry no longer. As I said, whatever I have to say again, I will say it during the policy debate. But you recall, Mr. Speaker, that earlier in this contribution, I said that the events in Beaufort provides an opportunity to confront realities that we have long resisted and ignored. Speaker, we're not going to resolve the problems in Beaufort by brute force, necessary as it may be in this period, or we are not going to resolve the problem by the traditional methods of policing, or by our own traditional handling of gangs in our respective communities. That can't be handled in the traditional way that we are accustomed to handling it. But I have argued that we need to pump resources into the communities dominated by gangs to integrate even those members into the economy provide sustainable economic opportunities, discourage crime as a way of life, to reduce and eliminate fear and win the support and sympathy of law-abiding citizens. Really what I'm saying is that we have to fashion a holistic project targeting each of those communities because there are variations in the respective communities. I find it interesting, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure other members may have their views of this, that in the Castries area, which for years had been the site of several gun battles, several killings, that Castries and its urban environment, save and except for the recent killings, have been rather peaceful. That is not to say there haven't been killings. And we have noticed a corresponding increase of killings in the, in the outskirts, outside of Castries. And Sufre is beginning to worry me immensely, Mr. Speaker. I'm seeing some things in Sufre that for me personally have become frightening because everybody knows I love Sufre dearly. And I have an extraordinary, wonderful relationship with the people of Sufre. But what is happening there, I mean, frightens me. Frightens me, frightens me. So we have to begin to understand that we can't handle this in a traditional way. And an escalation of crime act is not the ultimate solution. Admittedly, in the short term, it is necessary to restore calm and stability, but it cannot guarantee our future safety. Without saying much more, Mr. Speaker, I believe that this is the right time for a dedicated allocation to Vivot South to fight crime, to dismantle the gangs and disarm those who carry weapons. I really sincerely believe that. I believe that we should take the risk and make available some three to five million dollars targeting those communities in Vivot once and for all to deal with the problems. Problems of intelligence gathering, problems of eliminating fear, problems of providing economic opportunity, problems of dis in dismantling the guns, problem of redesigning how intelligence is gathered, our approach to guns. I say use this experience to make you for a model to deal with potential episodes elsewhere. I know the Minister of Finance is hearing this from me for the first time. I understand. After all, the estimates of revenue and expenditure were crafted, as I said at the very outset, weeks ago. So he doesn't have the opportunity to say, we have a problem in Dufort, and I'm proposing through these budgetary measures to deal with it, but I'm suggesting that we consider finding extra budgetary resources to allocate into a comp holistic program, but in tandem with social, with, um, with civic groups to develop a complete and comprehensive plan 
to deal with this and to reintegrate the police force into the life of the V4 community. I don't know whether people want to accept it or not. I don't know. There's a way that we don't want to face reality or face the music, but we love to sweep things under the carpet. But you know, I will tell you, one of the reasons why we have the kind of problems we have in Jufford is the police are fearful of entering into those communities because they fear for their lives. You may give them the, the best firepower you have, the best and latest M16, but they're not going to go in there, which means that a different approach of policing has to be utilized to regain control of those communities so that a police officer becomes once again normal part of the life of the people of the Fort South. That's what I'm trying to say, Mr. Speaker. That's what I'm really trying to say. And I want to urge that a special project be devised to focus exclusively on the Fort South, given the experience we have had, a comprehensive project that has to include support funding and guidance to the police to re-engage and re-enter the communities, Mr. Speaker. I believe, and I repeat what I have said, the initiative, the initiative of DCP Wayne Shallery is a welcome initiative. It deserves support, and it is good to see him working side by side with the people of, of Beaufort, especially in the fisheries complex to clean up. And I'm sure those of you who are meandering in my constituency next Sunday, passing through the constituency, whatever your business may be, if you want to experience, member for Denry North, what it is like no, no. in the efforts <laughs> to recultivate the community, I ask you to drop by the fisheries complex to meet the people at the complex and chat with them and get their reactions. And so, Mr. Speaker, I hope that consideration will be given to what I have said. Let me now conclude, Mr. Speaker, and I know it wasn't easy to listen to me this afternoon. Um, certainly wasn't easy to me with my agenda of issues and my agenda of, of complaints. But I know too you'll be kind and you'll say, well, no, don't worry. Don't worry, the member for Beaufort South. Just like they would say at CARICOM, you know, the major's catching up, he's involved in his meanderings, you know, so don't worry them. You have to be generous to him, man. But woe be unto you if you don't understand what I told you this evening. Woe be unto you if you don't get the messages that I issued this evening. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, let me conclude. I have no hesitation, Mr. Speaker, in joining my other colleagues in supporting the estimates of revenue and expenditure. Absolutely no hesitation. And I must say some of the indices are indeed pleasing and will deserve, certainly, very, will certainly deserve for the comment. But if you catch the drift of my contribution, Mr. Speaker, I believe you understand that I await the icing on the cake in the budget policy statement to be delivered later in April. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for your graciousness.